turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. Everybody got a lesson this morning? All right. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. We'll get started. Father, thank you this morning uh, once again. Uh, Lord, we can come hear your word. Lord, thank you for a copy of the scriptures we can have in our hands. Lord, I pray this morning that you would help me, Lord, as we look at this book uh, of Isaiah, and what it means and what it means. Uh, going to mean in the future and what it's mean, meant in the past. Lord, we, we love you, and uh, Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good to see everybody this morning. Good to see everybody back, and uh, Brother Bill's back, and uh, good to see Royce and him back, and uh, Brother Bob and him feeling a little bit better, and his wife Vicki, and uh, good to see everybody here this morning. And... Uh, this is going to be an interesting study. Uh, we're going to find uh, when we start looking at this uh, book of Isaiah. Uh, it's a long book, and we're going to look at it uh, again today. We'll probably more than likely only allow, uh, with the time constraints, uh, only we'll probably see it as far as just a, uh, part of the introduction. And, and, and again, when we start looking at Isaiah, when you look at this particular book, it's very important that you get the uh, the uh, background and the historical things about Isaiah down, uh, and then uh, because it's going to help you as we look uh, later on in the book, and then some of some of the chapters we may see together because they, they'll start dealing with these other nations and things like that. But uh, with the lesson uh, that everybody has. And I hope you uh, kind of hang on to uh, this because it's, it's what it amounts to. Is if you'll notice uh, on the sheet beside the lesson itself, I put two items there. One of them's kind of the map's kind of dark, and I apologize for that. And uh, but the other one, it doesn't matter as far as uh, that. This is the one we're going to kind of pay attention to because. <clears throat> You're going to see exactly, this is going to correspond when we start talking about these different kings uh, and what went on with their reign and what, what happened because <clears throat> as a result of what took place during these reigns of these kings, you'll see how that Isaiah will begin to fit together. And is what I'm going to try to do is as we look at Isaiah, I don't want any, uh, anybody to catch me wrong what I'm fixing to say. I, uh, the church is not Israel. Israel is not the church. Okay? And, uh, and we're going to talk about however, when we look at this, um, uh, <clears throat> as we look at this again and see this, I'm going to draw some parallels that have to do with our present state as far as we're concerned here in the United States and, and the world, different things like that. Okay, <clears throat> again, this was written, uh, as we're going to see, to, to two, <coughs> excuse me, two groups of people. And uh, again, it was written to Judah uh, and uh, Jerusalem because of the sin that they were in. Okay, and we're going to look at it because when we start uh, seeing it, it probably won't be until next week or possibly the week after, and I'm going to show you the parallels at the very beginning, some of them uh, that it's going to talk about as far as you and I are concerned, as far as the world and, and, uh, and the United States. And again, the United States is not in the Word of God. It is not as far as prophecy is concerned. It's not there. But the parallels that we see, man, is just something else because the Bible is always fresh. And again, uh, when we look at that, we're going to see that. And so this is going to be very important as we look at this thing uh, uh, because, again, is what happens when you get to the book of Isaiah and you, and you see Isaiah and you see what is exactly is taking place. Uh, again, we're going to look at this map 
And you're going to see how it is because it's what, what right before their eyes, Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, let's just read verse 1 so we'll kind of see what I'm, what, what I'm talking about. Uh, let's just look at verse 1, Isaiah 1. Notice what it says. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning who? Judah and Jerusalem, right? Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. In the days of, notice these four kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Now, if you'll notice that paper that I gave you uh, with the uh, thing, you're going to see how that they connect on there. Because if, uh, if you'll look, Judah has some kings, and it's kind of grayed out a little bit, but you'll notice if you can kind of put it up close to you a little bit there, you'll see the kings there in the, in the, in the timeline up above it, okay? And, uh, and so we'll get into that. Uh, each one of these kings uh, is going to reign a certain amount of time. Like Uzziah, uh, his name means strength of God. He's going to reign from about 941 or 741 to 7, or 791 to 740. Jotham, uh, his son, is going to be a co-regent. In other words, him and his dad is going to do it just a little bit together. And then you got Ahaz and then Hezekiah. Now, is how this is, uh, we want to look at that again uh, with the kings there. Uh, is what we see when we, when we take a peek at this uh, thing right here. Now, I didn't put this on your paper because I wanted, wanted you to see it right here. But it's what's going to take place is, is what happened is there was a, a t kind of give you a timeline here. Uh, Okay, is what you had <clears throat> is the first king was Saul. We know that. You can go back and read first, uh, the book of 1 Samuel from about the first 15 or 16 chapters. You're going to see Saul uh, and David a little bit. Then the next king, he, was, he ruled for 40 years. David is going to rule for 40 years. Seven years in Bethlehem and then the rest uh, 23 years in Jerusalem. You'll find him set up a lot from the tail end of uh, 1 Samuel. And then 2 Samuel uh, talks a lot about him there, uh, especially about the first 15 or so chapters when you get to David. And it's going to lay out his life and how he ran from Saul and he did this and did that. Uh, again, he was 23 years old when Saul began to chase him. And again, we see what kind of life he had. You can uh, see that mainly what his spiritual life was like by reading the Psalms uh, a lot because 73 to 74 Psalms were attributed uh, to David alone out of the 150 Psalms, okay? After David, uh, we know what uh, when he died, his son Solomon took over and he reigned for 40 years. So all of this right here is 120 years. Uh, now, in 930 B.C., it's because of the sin of Solomon when he began to uh, uh, accumulate all the wives and the concubines that's, that's talked about in there, Again, he led them. In other words, he began to show this thing about offering his kids in a sacrifice. Those sacrifices we've talked about in the past when we've looked at it, you know, uh, at uh, Molech and, and things like that. Again, that's where that big statue, they had this statue and it heated up uh, uh, this, I mean, this degrees hot and then they would uh, sacrifice, they put their babies uh, in there, the firstborn and stuff like that, and sacrifice. Whoop, that'll be sacrifice. <laughs> uh, uh, and so, as a result of this, God stirred up a man named Jeroboam, who who used to be with David, in other words, or Solomon in the kingdom. But he stirred him up to where uh, Solomon ran. He ran out of the country. Now, when uh, because Solomon sinned and did all those evil things that he did is what God did. He stirred that guy up. His name was Jeroboam. 
and Jeroboam left. Now, when he heard that Solomon had died, uh, the Holy Spirit again got a hold of him and says, hey, come down and rule. And if you will follow me, then uh, I'll bless you. And, uh, and again, he wasn't even from the Davidic line. But what we find out about uh, Jeroboam is <clears throat> he, began, is he, he immediately set up uh, this worship. Now, look on your map. And uh, again, it's, it's not the best in the world. But originally, is what you had is one kingdom. In other words, uh, the 12 tribes were allotted everything that God wanted them to have as far as the land. In other words, you can read about that in the book of Joshua. Uh, from about chapter 8 on to about chapter 20, 21, you'll see in the book of Joshua how that, uh, again, that, that they were allotted. And so as what happened is, if you'll notice the split, that's why it's called uh, down on the bottom, the divided kingdom, Israel and Judah. So as what happened is, Jeroboam, again, was, uh, he took over what is known as the northern ten tribes. In other words, from Dan, if you'll look at the top up north, almost to the very top, you'll see in little letters there, Dan. Uh, again, it's not the best. Uh, you may have a... a a map in your Bible that has basically the same thing. It's in color. Um, but if you'll notice, from Dan all the way down to Samaria. And as what happened is, during the, the ten tribes that went to Jeroboam, in other words, he got the ten northern tribes. That's what they were called. And uh, the name of it, and it's how you can distinguish this, is a lot of times in your Bible... Uh, instead of calling it the northern ten tribes, it's called Israel. Okay, and so that's how you can determine which king is which when you're studying your Bible. Okay, because if you, a lot of times you'll see the word uh, so-and-so was ruling, and then you got a, uh, two verses later that so-and-so was ruling. You say, well, I thought this other guy was ruling for 52 years. And, and so, again, that's how you distinguish. Now, the other two tribes, or Jeroboam, he made a worship center in Dan and in Samaria, Samaria being the headquarters, in other words, uh, there. And so you'll see and read about that over in the, in the, in the Samuels and, and the Kings a little bit about that. The, it's called Israel, okay? Now, the other two tribes went to Solomon's son. That was Jerusalem and then Judah. And that's what we, if you notice that very first verse that we read, it was Judah and Jerusalem in, in verse 1, okay? That's who it is. It's these two southern tribes. Now, is what took place is, after the split, this is how it was. Down here, in the southern two tribes is what you had is the capital was Jerusalem, okay? So when they came to worship, they went, all went to Jerusalem. But it's what Jeroboam did, Instead of, uh, he said, man, uh, if, they, if they all go down to Jerusalem to worship, guess what? I'm going to lose my kingdom. So he set up that, the worship in Dan and in, in, uh, down in Samaria. He set up two worship centers to where it was convenient for them to go down to, uh, to, to worship. And so uh, what you see, and so uh, Jerusalem and Judah. Now is what took place is... This uh, right here had 19 kings. The northern from uh, 930, Jeroboam being the first, until all the way to the very end, I think his name is Pekka or something like that, P-E-K-A-H. It, it's, uh, it's on your little sheet there. He was, a, if, I, if I remember right, uh, he was the last king of the, of, of the uh, northern tribes, okay? Okay. Uh, Matter of fact, uh, Til uh, Tilgath Pilsner, the king of Assyria, come in. Now, as what took place is, after the split, they had 19 kings. Every last one of these kings were evil to the core. Some of them worse than others, especially like Ahab. You get in there and the Bible said he was, you know, he was number one on the hit list. I mean, how bad this guy was. And he reigned a pretty good time. Well, actually, it was him and his wife. But his wife did more of, of the ruling than he did. 
Uh, he just more or less did what she told him to do, basically. Uh, again, he married her into the family is what, when he married her as a result to uh, bolster the, the defense of all the uh, outlaying areas and stuff like that. That's the reason he married her and became horrible. Now, what happened is 19 kings, 20 kings. About eight to nine of these 20 kings were good. Some of them were real good. We're going to talk about a, a couple of them today. Uh, uh, again, Uzziah wasn't a bad king until the end. And then we'll talk about that more in just a minute. And uh, again, you had Hezekiah, probably one of the best kings since David, uh, uh, along with Josiah and, and a couple of others. We'll, we'll get to those later on down the road. Okay? Now, as what happened is approximately 200... And 40 years after the split, after 930, about 240, give or take years right there, is what happened is as a result of sin and degradation, they did not listen to God, is what happened is God sent the Assyrians in in about 723 B.C. The Assyrians came in and it took them about three years. It, it wasn't just an overnight thing. But uh, because they had built up the cities around and, and the defense and everything like that. But finally, in about 723, that king that uh, come in and completely annihilated them, uh, almost. And is what happened is he, he split them up. He sent some over here, some over here to, to Syria, some over here. And that's how what we call the Samaritans come along. Because once he dispersed them where they couldn't do anything out there is what happened is uh, when he did that uh, you get they begin to intermarry with his, uh, the people in Syria and in the different places and they became what, what we call the Samaritans the Jews the Orthodox Jews of that day hated the Samaritans they called them dogs they called them all kind of you know dirty names they, you know dog you can read John chapter 4 that's why Jesus said I must needs go to Samaria he didn't have to. He said, I need, because he knew what was uh, lying ahead there and when he met the woman at the well. She was a Samaritan. Okay? Now, is what took place after this 345 years from the split, you're going to find these people completely annihilated, uh, dispersed, uh, sent into captivity uh, by Babylon. Okay? King Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, his son uh, uh, there. Uh, but this is uh, what it's going to bring. Now, Isaiah is what his letter is, is to these kings, later on other little nations down there, uh, that's gonna, he's going to talk about too when you get about to about chapter, I don't know, 24, somewhere around in there. He's going to begin to talk about some more of the nations. But anyway, 345. They didn't listen. They didn't watch what happened. It happened to them. And it started in, a, in about 606 uh, when that began, but so, somehow it didn't get finished until about 586 when it was completely gone. The wall, walls tore down. Everything was uh, plundered uh, in the temple. It was completely ravaged and tore down. And that's why you have the book of uh, Ezra. He's going to rebuild the temple. Nehemiah, the next book, he's going to rebuild the wall. And, uh, and so, uh, is what you, that's, uh, again, that's after the captivity, after, uh, that's going to be about 539 B.C., give or take a year or so, uh, like that, under uh, the Medes and the Persians, the King Cyrus, uh, who was not a bad king as far as being a lost man, you know, because he allowed, and God put it in his heart to let the people go and, and, and build and all this stuff like that, okay? They didn't listen. And so the exact same thing, only uh, kind of worse, because they, they completely destroyed. We're going to see exactly what took place in some of these kings in just a minute. But that's kind of some of the background as to why what we have Isaiah. Now, the book of Isaiah, his name means Jehovah is salvation, or salvation is of the Lord. Depends on you know, who you look at, but this is basically what, what it amounts to right here. Within that name, Jehovah is salvation. God is salvation. You find and see the whole book of Isaiah uh, like in a nutshell right there. Because it's what you're going to see. Salvation 
is he, uh, he's going to uh, uh, later on, you know, the Jews, he, we'll, we'll get to that when we hit about chapter 45. Uh, well, let's just turn there real quick. Uh, hold your place in one and turn to Isaiah 45. We'll see about this salvation thing. Isaiah 45, everybody there? Okay, notice verse 8. He says, drop, uh, uh, drop down ye heavens from above and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation and let the righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Now he's talking to Israel there. Now salvation is going to come to the Jews through the Jews later on. We'll, we'll get to that when we uh, talk about uh, how that Jesus Christ was the suffering servant. Isaiah 53. In other words, so what you have is in this salvation is you have salvation to the Jews, what we just read. Now look at verse 22, 45. Look at it. Uh, chapter 45, look at verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. So as what you see is salvation to the Jews. We just read in verse 8. Salvation to the, the whole world, the Gentiles. Uh, that would later on uh, salvation we uh, would come. And we see all that uh, figured out when you study the book of Daniel uh, from about chapter 9 to about uh, chapter 12 when it talks about how that uh, the Messiah will be cut off but not for himself. See, he did no sin. He, he didn't die for himself. He had no sin. He died for you and I. Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgression and so on and so forth. Okay? And so salvation and then later on down the road we're talking futuristic when we start looking at some of the uh, stuff uh, look at uh, Isaiah 61 I'm just kind of giving it to you in a nutshell right here where, where, where we're coming from Isaiah 61 everybody there notice what it says verse 1 it says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, that's Christ, because the Lord, that's God, hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and now stop right there, of the Lord. Now, as what you have here is, we don't have time, but that is a direct quotation you'll find that fulfilled in Luke chapter 4 when it says that Jesus sat down he was in the temple and he began to read and what did he read Isaiah 61 1 through about 4 give or take right there because he every one of those things is talking about him but notice what it says right here uh, verse 2 and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn to a point uh, unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise. Uh, and verse 4, And they shall build the old waste, they shall raise up former desolations, and they will repair the waste cities. You're talking about future. You're talking about at the end of the tribulation, uh, when you hit the millennial uh, time, you're going to see how that Israel, uh, God is going to once again begin to deal with them as a nation. Right now, he's dealing individually with them, not as a nation. In other words, if a Jew can get saved just like you and I can get saved if they repent of their sins and turn to Jesus Christ uh, for their salvation. That's what you see in uh, this name right here because this salvation is to the entire world. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Matthew chapter 11, John three sixteen. most of you quote, For God so loved who? The world. In other words, uh, uh, First Timothy over there uh, talked about he, he would have all men to come unto him. Second uh, Peter three nine. God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness. But uh, again, uh, when he's uh, talking about that, but he would have all men to be saved. 
And so, again, we want to see that. Now, is what, what we see back to Isaiah chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to hold off until next week and talk about who wrote Isaiah because there's a whole lot of uh, stuff going on and we'll talk about the history behind it from the 17 and the 1800s, uh, how did it begin to be changed, who they thought it was with these neo-Orthodox, some people uh, like uh, Barth and Brunner, some Germans, uh, this German higher criticism. I'll talk to you uh, next week about the history of all that, uh, about that, because the Word of God is still the Word of God. And as far as the Bible is concerned, I'm going to show you the Scriptures, because in 33 places you're going to find Jesus Christ quoting uh, uh, Isaiah. It's the second most quoted book out of the New Testament after Psalms. And so uh, we'll talk about that next week. Now, that's what we see in Isaiah, again, kind of like in a nutshell. Now, um, uh, let's talk about a, a tradition. Uh, they say that Isaiah, in other words, uh, was uh, kind of... Uh, connected to the royal family of some sort. In other words, Uzziah, the first king that's, that talked about, mentioned there, again, uh, uh, Isaiah's dad, Amos, in other words, is, uh, they think that he was somehow, king, he was the brother uh, to uh, this uh, king. And so this would make Isaiah kind of privy into a lot of the things that happened within there. Uh, again, Again, the royal family that his father, Amos, again, was the brother of King Amaziah. Amaziah is Uzziah. He's called Am, uh, Amaziah sometime and then sometime Uzziah. Uh, and, I'll, uh, and again, now, Isaiah was married. And again, uh, it's very important, and we'll look at that in depth when we get to it. But right now, I'll show you what, because it's kind of important to see this uh, later on down the road. Uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 8. There were some uh, guy, you know, some uh, people there. Uh, some of the prophets, God told them not to get married, like Jeremiah, uh, Hosea. He told to go marry, uh, you know, a hooker. Uh, and so again, he said, you know, go out there, you know, and do that. I want you to do that. And he's, he was going to show a picture between that. Again, a very good book to study. Uh, again, now look in Isaiah chapter eight, verse three. And I went unto the prophetess. Now, the prophetess right there is talking about Isaiah's wife. She was a prophetess, just like many other women in the Bible who were prophetess. I don't mean they were pastors and things like that. It just means that they uh, somehow God used them to foretell, just like Deborah over there in Judges chapter 4. You'll, you'll find uh, who was a prophetess. Miriam, uh, Exodus chapter 15, you're going to talk about uh, how that she was a prophetess. That was Moses' sister. Uh, uh, you get over to the New Testament, Acts chapter 8, I believe it is, when it talks about Philip there. He was, uh, his wife and, or his daughters were prophet. you know, there were four of them uh, who were prophetess. And so, again, we see his wife uh, was a prophetess. Look at verse, again, and I went into the prophetess, that's his wife. And she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, call his name uh, uh, Maher, uh, halal hashbaz again is what that means is speed the spoil hasten the booty because it's what it's amounting to again when you get to that hasten to pray it symbolized the doom that the prophet Isaiah expected to fall on the northern kingdom uh, when, when that, that, that guy's name right there now the other one again when you, when you see that the other one uh, look at uh, uh Turn back a page to chapter 7, verse 3. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz. Uh, that was the king. That third king on your paper there. And shear Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway. Now, as what this means is the residue, the remnant shall return. And so those two names, those two sons, along with his wife, were very important. Those names meant something. And again, the remnant shall return. He's talking about in the future. In other words, they're going to be doomed and destroyed. 
They were destroyed, like I said, in about 723 B.C., give or take a year or so. Uh, they were destroyed in about 586 completely, uh, when they were completely destroyed. And so, again, now there, there's always been a remnant. God has always maintained that. It's all through the Scripture when uh, He completely gives up on uh, Israel and He completely gives up on Judah. Uh, he divorces them. And again, that's what you, when you read Hosea, that's uh, making a comparison there about that particular thing. Okay? Now, uh, this guy's name meant haste uh, or, or uh, remnant shall return. Guess what? In the future, a remnant. God, you get over to Revelation from chapter 6 all the way to chapter 18, you'll see how that God from the four corners of the earth is going to uh, involve and bring all those Jewish people you know, back into the nation. Now, at the present time, some of this is taking place. We know that when they became a country in 1948 and things like that. But again, that's just on a small scale. You didn't see them from all, all completely everywhere coming from all four, uh, you know, in the whole world, all, you know, north, south, east, and west coming. Because, and so this is what that name means, that uh, even though they're going to be doomed, guess what, there's still going to be a remnant. You see the remnant, and you talk about a great deal when you get to the book of Daniel, chapter 1 and through about chapter uh, 3. Uh, there you're going to see you know, how the, the captives, matter of fact, Daniel and his three buddies were, you know, were captives, and they got all the smarts and the good looks, and so God you know, brought them to there. And they were supposed to learn the language and everything else. Within three years, they're going to have a, a little test by the king to see if they met the standards uh, of doing that. Okay, now he had these two children. Now, when you get to Isaiah, you're going to see that he's a, not only a prophet, he's a preacher, a theologian. In other words, a social critic. He's going to, he's going to bite bite him real good when he starts uh, giving, uh, predicting all this stuff. He advised kings. He was under the rule of four kings there. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. A poet, a psalmist. Matter of fact, when you look at the book of Isaiah, a lot of it is is uh, uh, this thing of uh, parallelism. Like I, I've talked in the past about how the like the the poetical books, or you read those uh, by parallelisms. In other words, you have a contrast here, parallelism, uh, things like that. That's the way this. When you look at Isaiah, it's written almost in the same way. Uh, when you look at it. Now, again, uh, you're talking about really talented was Isaiah uh, when it comes to all this, uh, being out there in the courtyard with all these kings and stuff like that. He wasn't like Jeremiah. You know, they put, punched and put him in a hole and did everything else there. Now, it's what it has. Uh, hold your place in, uh, in Isaiah 1 and turn back to Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit about the demise here. Uh, just throw it in here about Isaiah. Hebrews, New Testament. Philemon, Hebrews, James. So you got... I started to teach the book of James. <laughs> and, uh, look at verse 37. Everybody there? We're talking about all these martyrs, okay? Verse 37, look at verse 36. Others had trial, um, a trial of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. That don't mean they went to the smoke shop. They were sawn asunder. That right there, by tradition, according to the Talmud, we're not exactly, you can't say dogmatically that this took place but uh, Talmud, the Talmud uh, the, those Jewish writings which don't amount to a hill of beans and most of them are stupid uh, when you read some of those things and I've read some of those things and they're about the stupidest thing going I mean it's like reading you know some of these funny magazines out there you know like Time Magazine and Psychology Today that's, a, that's the kind of stupid stuff uh, that the Talmud comes up with that's those Orthodox Jews they they put more into that, that tradition of that stuff, than they do the Word of God. And so, uh, again, is what takes place when uh, you see that tradition has it. He lived through those four kings. 
uh, that I put on your paper right there, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and then the last one, Hezekiah. The next one was Manasseh, who was, he, uh, who was Hezekiah's son. Who was, he, was, he was wicked. You roll all those kings up in the north and put it in one ball and you got uh, uh, Manasseh. He reigned 55 years. He reigned the, the, uh, the most of any of the kings of, of the south there, 55 years. The next guy reigned 52, and that's Uzziah, the first king. Anyway, tradition has it that uh, he either died after Hezekiah, and that's why they say tradition, or he could have finished his work for God after Hezekiah and lived a little bit uh, under the reign of Manasseh. And they say that Manasseh got so mad at some of the stuff that he was predicting and saying about the king and about him that uh, he had him sawn asunder. In other words, he put him in a tree, uh, put a, a tree out there and uh, put uh, Isaiah in between it and used a saw to cut him in half. That's what uh, history and tradition says, right there, sawn asunder. And when you read that in, in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, I've seen stuff like that. I remember uh, when in the very first war there uh, that... Uh, when they first captured that one boy uh, there in, uh, in Afghanistan and how they, they put him on trial. It was on t you know, they had shots of it and stuff like that. And when it first come out, I, I clipped it and I had it of where they cut that guy's head off. And they, they let the whole world see it. And it was a thing like that. And I sat there and watched that young kid. Man, they just marched him up there and whatever they said. And you could see the guy blindfolded with that knife. And he literally, he didn't just chop his head off. He literally sawed his head like this, you know, with a, you know, and stuff like that. And so I know basically what they're, you know, kind of what they're talking about right there. And so, uh, again, that's uh, uh, what we see about Isaiah there. Now, um, uh, let's talk about the theme and again, the overall theme, like I said, is found in this name. In other words, it, it shows what took place then, what's going to what took place as far as Jesus is concerned when He comes, and then also what's going to take place in the future. Uh, because you know, uh, you've probably seen it, and we put it up here a million times. You got the church age right here. You know, you got Christ when uh, when He arose from the dead. Then you got the church, whatever it is, you know, to whenever. Uh, we don't know, and all these people that try to make a claim uh, is just lying. Uh, uh, again, then you got the rapture, then you got the tribulation, which you, we don't know exactly, but you know we know it's seven years, things like that. But we don't know the exact time and when it starts, and you know and things like that. And then you got the millennium, which is a thousand years. And so what? That's what we see when we come to the book of Isaiah, how that all that was, you know, back here. Before the cross, that's B.C., before the cross. Then you got A.D., which is that Italian expression, after the cross. And so, you'll get that in a minute. Now, Jehovah is salvation again. Now, the salvation of Israel, we looked at that. Now, within Isaiah, back to Isaiah chapter 1, it's been referred to, and I'll just you know spend a little bit of time with this, called a little Bible. And I put you know on your thing, and the reason that uh, that you see that uh, that it was called the little Bible is because of the of what what, what uh, of how it's uh, set up is is what you have is you have how many books. In the whole Bible, you have 66 in Isaiah. How many books in the Old Testament? All right? Isaiah, you know, 1 through 39. Well, actually, it's 1 through 36, but it's what you have is 36 to 39 is what you have is kind of like an interlude because it's going to give it's going to give you a picture inside of Hezekiah's prayer life and what he went some of the things he did which is really nice but as what you have in the in the old testament is judgment God sending a lot of judgment in other words he's telling them how to live 
And when they don't do it, the judgment is coming. Well, guess what? In other words, you have, uh, again, that's what we see in, in, uh, in the Old Testament and also the first uh, 39 chapters of Isaiah. Again, is what you're going to see is judgment. We're going to look at judgment of these different nations and uh, Edom and uh, some of these places, Moab and, and things like that, of what's going to take place for them in the future a little bit. And so we'll see that and what God is going to do with these nations that messed with uh, his people as a result of that. How many books we got in, uh, in the New Testament? 27. That leaves 27 over here. 39. Is what you have is Jesus Christ. In other words, here uh, from the last 27 books is what you see again uh, uh, or is the New Testament. You see grace. In other words, how that Jesus Christ left heaven, came down here, born of a virgin. We're going to see that, Isaiah chapter 7. We're going to talk about it, you know, him uh, being the everlasting father, Isaiah 9, 6, uh, and Isaiah 7, 14. And so, again, is what you see is grace. That's what grace is, a suffering servant as a result of that. You see that in Isaiah 53, grace. And what do you see over here? Christ coming, his uh, first coming there and how that he lived and died, and then he gave us instructions on how to live from about Romans all the way down to Philemon uh, and uh, there. And so then it's what you have is grace. So you see they kind of parallel one to another, and that's why they call it the little Bible. Again, what is, uh, uh, if you have 39 chapters, the next number is what? Okay, this is 40. What do you have in chapter 40? You have John the Baptist. In other words, he's going to call the forerunner and John the Baptist in chapter 40. Chapter 40, verse 3, is what you're going to have, is, like I say, John being foretold as being the forerunner of Christ. What is the 40th book over here, in the, uh, once you, uh, uh, again, in the New Testament? What's the 40th book? Matthew, right? All right, that's the 40th book over here. The third chapter of the 40th book is John the Baptist comes on the scene. Preaching, repentance, get right, uh, God is coming. <laughs> or I mean, uh, repent. Jesus, what did he preach? The same thing. Now, and so it's kind of uh, just called that, you know, it's a little thing, you know, thrown aside. But people say, well, that's a coincidence. I don't think so. <laughs> you know, when you, when you look at it, you, you know, how many of those coincidences coincidences have to happen before we realize that what we have is a special book right here. And so I'm going to have to kind of um, stop there. We'll get into the historical next week when we talk about these four kings right here. We'll go one by one uh, to see exactly what happened in their reign and what took place and how this uh, stuff that took place is happening right now. You see the exact same thing. Look at verse 4 real quick. It says, Ah, sinful nation of people laden with iniquity. I see the United States right there. Laden with iniquity. Bogged down, man, this sin. You name all the stuff they're trying to pass, it's even getting worse and worse. And guess what? It's going to get worse. The Bible even talks about it. In other words, uh, again, you see that uh, children uh, that are what? Corruptors. That's exactly what took place. Uh, Proverbs chapter 30, sometime read it, it talks about there's a generation that. And then it talks about how these kids, of, of kids, this is taking place. And so, again, uh, we see that, in other words, kids that are corruptors. Uh, for the most part, again, you see a lot of these uh, people that's uh, shooting these schools and stuff like that. A lot of them are kids. 16, 17, 18, 20-year-old kids doing the exact same thing. In other words, corrupting. Uh, and again, uh, children are being corrupted. You know, and things like that by the stuff that's being taught in the schools. And it's a mess out there. And sometimes I think we forget about that. And that's why, you know, these, these things like Masters Club, Brother Rusty and them, is so important because you got kids that's growing up uh, and by the third grade, they didn't know everything that you and I know when we was, got married 20-something years old or whatever. That's the kind of trash that they're in the third grade that they're teaching out there. And from the third grade on up. So you see, this book is going to correlate with that. 
And so is what we see, and I, and I hope you come back and uh, look at uh, Isaiah 1, just read it. And uh, again, we're going to uh, start talking about the theme and the historical background uh, next week, Lord willing. Father, thank you for the Word of God. Lord, thank you that it's truth. And Lord, I'm grateful, Lord, how you laid it out. Lord, your thy Word, Lord, is uh, very special. And Father, uh, you've placed your Word above your name. Your word says, and I pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to realize what we have. And, Lord, uh, the only thing we have to live by is this book right here. Lord, help us to be students of the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen.